Um, as we're all settling in, um, hello and welcome to my talk. Um, I talk around um, about CDNs and beyond. Um, we cover how we can speed up websites beyond just having a US or Europe-centric uh, focus. Um, I truly appreciate that you're still coming to sessions. It has been three days full of sessions and a lot of things, and maybe one or two Guinnesses in the evening and other things. Um, are you all having a good time so far? Yes, yes great. Um, the alternate title of my uh, session is Make It Fast. Um, who of you likes to have fast websites? Hands up. Who managed it to do it even if you're sitting in a train? Uh, not that many. How about if your people are, let's say, in India or in China or in South Africa? Then it gets a little bit, oh, thank you. Uh, you can uh, join me on stage if you want to because you're pretty settled in. So, um, yeah, I'll talk about this. Um, I'm Bastian, working uh, at MACIO as a systems engineer. And for the Drupal world, I'm contributing or contributed to the Drupal CI, which tests all your patches which you upload. So that was my contribution to it. Um, for the agenda, we start with a small introduction. Then we touch base with the key facts of fast websites. Um, we are also covering several CDN solutions. We then segue into hosting in China, which is probably really interesting for you. And it comes a little bit late, but I felt I need to give you a proper introduction in like what can be accomplished and what parts need to be optimized to really run in China. Because if you to start in China, and then you didn't look at all the key factors, then you'd start redeve redeveloping everything. Um, I touched small uh, parts of the cache warming we do for the China caching infrastructure, and then some takeaways from the, um, from the whole presentation. But what makes websites fast? Some basics. You need to keep your website, the footprint, the bytes you need to transfer from your server to your end user's browser, may that be a mobile device or uh, a desktop computer or a tablet as small as possible. You need to keep the requests pretty low because if you have a lot of requests, it takes a long time on bad connections to just go back and forth. DNS lookups is also something, they should be fast. It also depends where your server is located. So if you use, in, let's say, New Zealand and your server is somewhere in the Arctic, it takes quite a long time to get the data over. Bandwidth is an issue and caching on the client side and also on the server side. But you might ask, why should I care? Well, you've probably seen that quote quite a few times. So Amazon found out that every 100 milliseconds of latency and page load time costs them 1% of profit. Just keep that in mind when you're developing a website or a product where people spend money on, that if it's fast, you have them. They will like, okay, I want to buy that. They click, it loads, it loads, ah, they fade away. If they click and it just loads right away and they can like, pay you, then you've won. So fast websites also have a good turnover. Another really, really good talk is uh, the website Obesity Crisis um, from the guy who's running uh, pinboard.in. Uh, and he looked at the size of websites over quite a long time. And when he started to write his talk, a website was around 1.8 megabytes and he just extrapolated the data he found and said, hmm, at some point we will reach five megs for that site. And he just waited some years and went back to that website. They did a redesign. The content was still the same, but they had like added two or three megs of data which has to be transferred in between. Um, he then came to a really interesting tweet. So he said, he proposes that your website 
should not exceed the size of major works of Russian literature. Because if your website is more than 1.8 max, if you're targeting countries which aren't that fortunate with uh, bandwidth, you should probably scale your websites down a bit. I'll touch back on that when we are getting back into the whole China thing, because their bandwidth is something which really is different. I mentioned you should keep your number of requests pretty low, so bear with me. So less requests mean you need to do less connections to the server. It means also you need to do less round trips back and forth, and that equals in the faster website. With Drupal, you do that, for example, if you do the CSS and JavaScript aggregation. So all your files are compacted into one file, and you just do one round trip. So DNS lookups is another thing. Um, if you look how a website is transferred from your server to your end device, it starts with DNS resolution. And before we even get to the server, we need to find out the IP address of that given server. So that's 56 milliseconds. And they're gone. You can't do something with it. They're just the device asking for the IP address of the server. It can be if you have your DNS server located somewhere in the States that it takes some time to get there, get the IP, and go back to you. So you can do optimization on that part. Um, I did a little bit a different thing, and I traced um, a HTTPS connection. So that's a really good closed DNS server. It takes five milliseconds. That's, that's pretty darn good. Um, then we open a TCP connection, which takes around 30 milliseconds. And then we do the SSL handshake, and that's where things get really ugly, because it just takes 176 milliseconds, and you can't get around them. It will be probably a bit better with HTTP2, but as you probably heard in the talks um, earlier, uh, Human um, or Fastly was speaking about HTTP2. Um, probably it's not, HTTP2 is not what you're expecting to um, encounter. And then we arrive at the server and he gives us an answer of 33 milliseconds. That's fast. You might wonder why the content transfer is zero, because it's a redirect. So it was just a header coming back. So the transfer was pretty small. Um, settle in with a good DNS provider. So hmm, that's interesting. Um, you can roll it your own for fun and profit, but probably it's not that easy and not that sustainable because, yeah, who had problems in setting up uh, C names on his um, root domain. Quite some. Yeah, that's the thing. By design, you cannot have a C name pointing to your root domain. There are some providers which just go over that RFC and find it, found solutions. You can settle in with DIN, uh, NS1, or go with Route 56, uh, 53. Um, they all support it in more or less good ways, and they all have um, really good uh, geolocated DNSs. So your request will end up quite near to you. So sometimes we also talk about server location, and the discussion in the end at some point ends up with me saying physics. So... Given an example, um, we have a big customer in the States, and uh, he has a user base in Switzerland. And he says, oh, the site is slow. I see it on Google. And then I say, yeah, of course it's slow. All your traffic needs to go back to the States. So bear with me when I go full on physics with you. Um, C, the speed of light in vacuum, is uh, around roughly 300,000 kilometers per second. For the moment, sadly, you can't get faster than that. Um, if we would do that, that would be awesome. If you can do it, get back to me, because we should start a business on it. Um, that's where CDNs come into play. And um, the CDN is basically moving the endpoint of your web server closer 
to your user. Um, that helps a lot because you can cache the full um, sites of your user near them, so they don't need to go back to the states. If, if you're here, you just have a, probably a point of presence in Dublin where you get the traffic handled on. Caching, so I guess nobody would survive without Varnish. Say hi to Varnish. I guess everyone is using it and we discussed uh, yesterday during, during dinner um, what would happen if Varnish would decide that they go on a full blown just pay per use product. I guess we would all be pretty unhappy about that. So Varnish saves our life, it caches on the front of your web server infrastructure and that helps you a lot. But how about client-side caching? Um, our infrastructure, uh, which I run, um, we try to set long-lived headers as, as much as possible because when you do requests over and over again and you go uh, to the start page and then you move to another page, um, you don't want to reload all the assets you had in your site. So that's helping quite a lot. There are a lot of really good resources and I'll put them in the end of the slides which you can read through and probably find solutions and um, ways to deal with the request headers. Actually, yeah, CDNs can help you and they are pretty everywhere. So that's the point of presence map of uh, Fastly. Um, Everywhere you are, or nearly everywhere, there's a big void in China um, and Russia. Yes, but that problem is solved, you know, <laughs> because we have a cache note there. Um, so everywhere you are, it tries to find the closest point of presence to you. So it speeds things up. And that brings us to CDNs and beyond. Um, I work with several vendors. One is Fastly, Cloudflare, or KeyCDN. You can also go to Akamai, but then you need to have a big company credit card because it gets really expensive at some point. Um, I'll just touch base a little bit with the, the pros and cons which all those providers have. So Fastly is really good. You have a pay-as-a-go um, payment. Uh, it's built by requests and the bandwidth you use. Basically, you can think uh, about it as a distributed varnish as a service. So they have a lot of um, point of presence where they just have a lot of varnish power and you can just ship your VCL to it and it will make your sites faster. You can do full page caching and they also do DDoS mitigation. SSL, on the other hand, because we are moving into a world where we are having a lot of SSL going on, and Google is also ranking you lower if you don't have an, uh, your site available by SSL. So SSL is coming with a premium for Fastly, but as far as I heard this week, they're working on it to revamp their pricing structure a little bit to make that work. The other one is Cloudflare, and I usually refer to it as nobody ever got fired for using Cloudflare because it's a freemium thing, you can start with it. It supports SSL, they can do DDoS protection. It's kind of proprietary because in the end you're handing over your DNS server to them. And I'm not sure, but in information technology you don't like to put all your baskets, uh, all your eggs into one basket. So I'm not liking that too much, but for some, re uh, for some site it's really good to use it. Another one is KeyCDN. Um, they also have a pay-as-you-go um, price scheme. I started to use them because we have a site which has heavy traffic in Switzerland and we wanted to make leverage of a CDN. Um, the problem is most of the CDNs aren't in Switzerland. So the nearest pub would be Frankfurt and our servers are in Zurich. So you move traffic back and forth, which is not good for performance either. So we started with them. Um, Sadly, currently they can't do full page caching. Uh, as far as I heard, it will be possible in a few months. So we have another competitor in that market which helps you quite a lot to do that. 
Currently, it's perfect for delivering assets because they come with a free SSL certificates for all your assets, so you can leverage that. But how about other countries, you may ask? Well, let's talk about China, and that's where the things get really interesting now. So basically, unlearn everything you know about the internet. Oh, that worked out. That was basically a choke now. So China is different. So to do's, get a partner in China that may be your beloved client who has an office there because you really, really need them. As, as a European, you can't just go there and say, hey, Amazon, I'd like to have one server. Can I get one? They are like, uh, Chinese? And they basically say, well, we give you servers, but you need to have an office somewhere in China. You need to speak Chinese. And it's getting a little bit complicated there. Um, the other to do is if you have a customer base in China, you need to have a server within the mainland China. You need to be prepared to rethink how you build your site. And you need to obtain an ICP license. All heads go up now. And ICP what? So yeah, um, Wikipedia says uh, it's a permit issued by the Chinese Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, basically. And what it is, it's that. It's a license plate for your website. Um, it needs to be on every website you put out and host in China, even if it's just caching. So it's if you go to Baidu, it's that string on the bottom. And if you have that in, then everything is good. But if you don't get an ICP license, they will shut you down. And that's something I was like, wait, they can't shut me down. I still have like my server. And it actually happened to us. So they shut down our site. Monitoring went red. I was looking on it. Server looks fine. I can get on it. Um, checking the main IP. Some other site in Chinese was coming up. And I was like, <laughs> what? So basically what they do, they have, every hoster has a big uh, NAT router, which they put my IP in front and some web server in the back. And I get just access to the web server. And it looks perfectly fine as long as you connect by SSH over the same IP. But if you do web traffic over it, it says, oh, well, sorry. Chinese government said no. So that's a thing we, we started looking at our website and did some tests, and we started to find out what we did wrong to host our site in China. So we had web fonts loaded. Um, connections from inside mainland China to, let's say, Switzerland or the US are capped to a 15 kilobits speed. That's pretty slow. Have you ever thought about how big your web font files are? Even if they are 300K, it takes quite a long time to transfer it. And then there is that huge, wonderful key image you have on your front, which is also optimized that somebody can go on with his iPad, and it's like two megs. And your site is loading and loading and loading, and it's just that keyframe visual you have on the top. Um, Another thing is host your JavaScript libraries on your own because you also don't want to have connections going out to it for. Um, getting rid of external JavaScript dependencies is also an important thing. And don't try to do HTTPS, please don't. Or get a license, but that costs also a lot of money. So try to get rid of them that too because they will shut you down if you have HTTPS running. Fun fact, we have a monitoring site which is on HTTPS and that got shut down too because, yeah. But why, you may ask? Well, that request, or that request, or that request, it's all in your websites. And, well, it goes to Google APIs. The Chinese and Google, they aren't that friends with each other, so they cap or stop your requests. Twitter? They have their own Twitter. Why would you even think about 
adding a Twitter widget. So the thing is, and the thing that makes you your day and your ops people, like the day of your ops people really bad is the Great Firewall of China. Um, it's the thing you don't really, it's not something that works the same all the time. Um, I always refer to it, the firewall is blocking your requests, maybe sometimes a little bit, sometimes it throttles it, and it's really unpredictable. I have a slide quite uh, a little bit later which also shows you how that thing works. So, friendly advice, if you host in China, get a separate domain. Because um, you don't want to have all your content on one domain because you need to somehow split your content. You want to have the full-blown website with all the Twitter widgets, with all the JavaScript ready on one end, and you have a stripped-down version on yourcustomer.cn, um, which helps you a lot to like maintain those two sites and have it fast. Um, try to strip out everything you don't need. Do you really need a draggable Google Maps map, or is an image probably enough? So think about those things. Try to think about outside the box when you tackle those issues. Um, while you're on it, get a Chinese DNS provider too, because you have the same issues when with uh, DNS requests from within the firewalled zone to the outside zone, because it's just slow. Sometimes they don't resolve. Sometimes it just takes 30 seconds. And then you get at that tipping point where all your applications start to fail because all the timeouts are around 30 seconds. And sometimes it goes, sometimes it doesn't work. Friendly advice number three. Who speaks Chinese? Nobody. Um, learn Chinese or hire somebody who speaks it fluently. Um, because you, you really don't want to deal with the authorities there. And probably they also may not speak to you because you didn't grow up there, so and you don't have a passport there. Some other people are saying, okay, why not just get a Chinese CDN, right? Well, others say, okay, no problem. We have a CDN, a point of, of presence in Hong Kong, but um, Hong Kong is not mainland China, so it's outside of the firewall zone. And we actually did some tests, so we did a huge list and searched for providers, which are like cloud providers, and we got servers everywhere, and we tried out. And even there is like, you could nearly draw a line on the map where the firewall zone is beginning and where it isn't. So as long as you're not within this zone, you can't do something. Um, another thing is the CDNs are pretty expensive. I just like blacked out something on that. Um, I asked like, hey, uh, I'd like to have your CDN solution. They were like, yeah, sure. It just costs you 12.8K per month. And my customer was like, wait, what? <laughs> because it outnumbers your costs of the hosting quite easily. And the thing is, if you think about your networks or your internet infrastructure in your country, um, you, you're probably aware that there is an interconnect in every, con uh, in every country. So if you're talking Amsterdam, there is the Amsterdam Internet Exchange where the providers peer up to, in order to make your connections as fast as possible and you d your traffic should not go if you want to talk to a server in Switzerland over the States, you can go via England back to Switzerland from here. Um, they don't do that in China. In China, every internet provider is basically owned by the country. So they think, mm, well, it doesn't fast internet? Why? It's fast within. If we peer with each other, that would be even faster, but that would also mean cost. So we don't do that. Um, the fun thing here is, you can have two tiers. One is the pricey one, which basically they are interconnected with all providers, and the cheaper one, which they are only interconnected with the top three providers. So 
that's something which you can think about. I don't recommend it though because it's really pricey. Um, the price tag comes also with some services, which is good because they may help you getting the ICP license, but you still need to have a valid, um, a valid company in the open company which does sell goods in, in China. So if you're just an agency and going there and say, hey, I would like to do that, they say no because you can't speak on behalf of your customer. So there's a lot of red tape involved and you don't want to do that. Um, yeah, the thing is, if you pay money and pay somebody money, you also have someone you can blame, which is really good when it breaks. To have a server in mainland China, and that's what we currently do, is I always say I treat it like having a server on the moon because you can't see the moon all day because at some point you don't see him and in the evening he reappears. So we can't connect to that server all the time and we needed to find solutions um, how we deal with it. Puppet runs, yeah, heck, they take around 30 minutes and plus and they don't do something. They just try to connect to the puppet master we have in Zurich and it just takes ages to get through it. Um, SSH connections, yeah. If you have an outage, you need to like probably make a T first, open the SSH connection, and really calm your nerves because you type and sometimes it starts to reappear there. Um, the connections are slow. There is a lot of packet loss. And I always say, let's get creative. We know what we had until, or what we saw until now, but we don't know what is starting to appear tomorrow. Probably tomorrow they shut down something. Probably tomorrow, half a day we don't have a connection. There's fun involved. That was the thing I got when they took down the site and I was like, wait, what? And I got back to, to, to a provider or the, the guy who was owning the server um, and it was like, yeah, well, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, can you call the government? Uh, and he was like, well, calling the government, that's like, that's really, no, no, can we, can we just leave it as it is? And like, no, your site is down. Um, so you deal with a lot of things that you don't have when you host somewhere in a country, um, which doesn't have that intranet thing. Another thing, um, Actually, that was yesterday morning, 6.30, uh, something like that. Um, that's IPv4 connection, and 4 is good, and that's like I don't connect, and I don't connect, and well. Um, the thing what we do is we warm our caches there, and uh, we have long-lived caching. So we have actually a cache warmer which ca starts to cache the site, and if we lose connection, we just serve stale caches for a long time. Um, that's not the perfect way to do it. It's the cheapest way to do it. We told the customer, hey, you might not have all the features you want to have on that website, but in the end, do you really need all those features? And we just narrowed it down to a feature set where they say, okay, we can live without that, but we need a web form. So for web forms, we have other solutions to like redirect them to an external solution, which works in China and is probably hosted in China because it's faster. I already started talking about warming the caches. So with Warnish 3, we had Warnish Replay. Who is using it? Nobody. Who's using one if four? Ah, that's okay. Who's still stuck with three and doesn't know how to update the, the VCLs? Nobody, good. Um, well, with one is three, we had one is replay and then we updated, or started to update to one is four and our testing environment broke and I was just logging into the box as one does running Varnish Replay and say that Varnish Replay isn't installed. I was like, why would Varnish Replay not be here? It's a part of Varnish since a long time. Um, a lot of yuck shaving later, I found that 
uh, in the changelog of Varnish 4, they removed it. There was no public announcement about that. And we were like, ha, that's bad. <laughs> because all our cache reformers were breaking. So we started looking for solutions. And actually, what we found is uh, Go Replay. Um, probably some of you are familiar with the tool. Uh, Go Replay basically spawns a process, and you can say, listen to the traffic on your port 80 and send it to, the, to another server. So what you can do there is um, you have a staging environment, or it's originally built to do load testing on a staging environment. Um, you say, OK, take the traffic of port 80 and send it to another server. So it's not getting in your way of, of production traffic. It just listens and gets the, the connect CC and sends it to another one. The cool thing about this, you, that tool is you can write the request to a file, and that's exactly what we do. Um, we are running um, a full site load of every site every day. So if content changes, it lands into that file, and we, we know the links and URLs and assets which are present, and we rerun that on a regular basis. So we warm the cache with all the content we have. It's not the best way to do it, but it works pretty well, because you do it every day, and you're good. And the, in the end, your users are always having the most um, recent content on it. So how it works for us is we have, in China, we have a Varnish server which tries to connect back to the Nginx Varnish um, servers in um, Europe. And if we don't get a connection, we just retry it. And you need to be really graceful with all your connections because they may time out. Um, the Gore proxy, on the other end, is logging all the requests which are fed into Varnish and sending it to a file, and we just start to warm the cache all the time. And the good thing is, uh, if we have a hit already, means if we have the asset already cached, we just go to the next one, because we don't need to update it. So takeaways. Um, you need to optimize your site. And if you know you have a project which the customer is really fond of hosting in, let's say, China or India, Russia, or South Africa, then you need to think about how many requests you're doing. Strip your content down and minimize your website to what you really need. Um, China is different. Be prepared also for that. It's not just different in a technical way of saying. It's different in a way of how people deal with each other. Your provider may not want to talk to the authorities about they, they shutting down your site because it's not how they deal with it. So you need to find ways and you need to, to learn how they work. Um, what we learned on that way is there is no cheap way of dealing with that. So it's really hard. You can find a solution to do it, but the cheap way is not always the best. And get good partners early on also means Prepare your client that he will pay probably more for his website in China than he pays for the whole Europe and the US combined. So that's one thing we, we really pushed our client and say, OK, you want to go to China, be aware that you will need to pay money to make that happen. Um, of course, you can move your site or clone your site completely to China. But if you have backends you want to talk to, or if you have a login and shop solution, then it gets really, really complicated at some point. Yes, that concludes basically my talk about how you can deal or how you can get into uh, the Chinese market for a start. If you want to grow bigger, then you need probably to invest more money to like get proper CDN solutions or maybe have your website cloned there and 
find a way how you deal with the backend situation because not every project needs it. Our customer is happy to have like a read-only news site which informs the user base about the latest news, the latest products, and so on. Yes, questions. I'm happy to answer all of your questions if you have. So have you, have you worked with the thing called the Golden Machine in China? Uh, the question was, I'm just rephrasing because of the recording. Um, the question was if I have worked with the Golden Machine? Yes. No. Can you, if you probably walk up to the microphone so people can hear it. Uh, so I just heard of it before because of another uh, possible project we did. So, but the Golden Machine is supposed to be, uh, for a commerce site, you actually have to send all the transactions information to yeah, a governmental uh, server, basically. So I, that's why. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I didn't hear about that. Um, I We had a lot of things that were like, I bought virtual servers and wired the money over to them and the transaction was done and I didn't get a virtual server. So I'm usually really, really careful if it comes to that because you just don't know. And if the other end doesn't reply, you're basically, you're done. The thing is, um, yeah, they deal completely different with uh, handing over data to the government. If you would ask your customer, like, are you fine if, you, if the government is informed about every order we place into your system, the Chinese would probably say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, let's do that. And your customer is like, uh, no, why? So that's things you, which are a little bit different between you. It's a cultural thing. Other questions? Lucian? <laughs> Afterwards. Yeah, I'm here um, today um, and tomorrow during the sprint, so if you want to talk, discuss something about it, just hit me up. I'll be around and available for you. Thank you.